35-year-old Ivan Lester McGuire was an experienced skydiver who had completed more than 800 successful jumps. He was an adrenaline junkie, a daredevil, someone who wanted to live life on the edge in order to appreciate their time in the world. On April 2nd of 1988, Ivan had a gig filming a skydiving instructor and student during a jump. Ivan had already done two successful jumps at the Franklin County Sports Parachute Center in North Carolina, so this next jump seemed like nothing, just another day of free-falling. When the plane reached 10,000 feet in the air, Ivan jumped out of the plane with the instructor and student. Everything seemed to be going fine until the instructor and student opened their parachutes. That's when Ivan realized he didn't have one. He had forgotten to wear his parachute. He was hurtling towards the ground at terminal velocity with no way to slow his descent. When Ivan realized his mistake, he said the chilling phrase that would end up being his final words, Oh my god, no. His body was discovered in the woods about one and a half miles away from the airfield. Mark Lumen, the pilot, was investigated in order to determine whether or not he had checked to make sure Ivan was wearing a parachute. According to the inspector who handled the case, there is a regulation number 105 that states that no one may jump unless the pilot checks the parachutes. None of the other jumpers on the plane had noticed Ivan's mistake, most likely because he was so highly experienced that nobody had even considered this possibility. The wife of the man who owned the parachute center stated that no one was aware that he got on the plane without a parachute. Of course, no one knew or they would have stopped him. After the investigation, foul play was ruled out and it was also determined that Ivan had not intentionally taken his own life. His death had simply been a tragic accident. The general consensus is that Ivan mistook his camera gear for a parachute because it had a similar weight. Police Captain Brown said, I think in the excitement over taping the show, I think he just forgot his parachute. As far as the Sheriff's Department is concerned, it was an accident. Let this serve as a reminder to always triple check your safety gear whenever you're doing something that could potentially be dangerous. Accidents happen when you least expect them. This next video comes from the home security system of a TikTok user. The footage was posted by an account called ThisLife85 in 2022 and not much is known about the footage. However, I'm sure it was terrifying for the homeowner to wake up to in the middle of the night. Yo! Yo! Yo, Kevin! Come on, bro! At one point in the video, one of the men pulls out what looks like a gun. They were clearly at the house for nefarious purposes, so it's good that the homeowner didn't open the door. It's disturbing to think about what might have happened otherwise. This next video comes from the dash cam of a vehicle that was driving down a highway in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The car has a front camera and a back camera, so you'll actually get to see both perspectives of the incident. With the front camera's perspective, it looks like the red car simply lost control, maybe as a result of the weather, but the back camera shows what really happened. The white car attempted a lane change, but forced the red car into the guardrail. The red car did nothing wrong. This accident was entirely the fault of the white car. I was unable to find any more information on this incident, but I hope everyone involved was unharmed. Stay vigilant and always remember to practice defensive driving techniques. Accidents can just as easily be caused by other people as by yourself.
At around 11 p.m. on September 5th of 2018, Leah Dierico and her two children, 17-year-old Daniel and 12-year-old Sarah, were at home in their Boca Raton residence. Leah's husband, Thomas, was away on a business trip at the time. All of a sudden, their ring doorbell camera picked up something that terrified the family. Their neighbor, 48-year-old Kevin Flaherty, approached their house with an assault rifle in his hand. Leah and the kids all hid in the bathroom together. Even though Thomas was away at the time, he received a notification on his phone and he called the police while Daniel did the same. According to Thomas, it took 25 minutes for the police to respond to the call. In other words, the family had to sit in their bathroom for 25 minutes hoping that their armed neighbor wasn't going to do anything. Luckily, Flaherty left the house without firing his weapon, but when the police arrived, they mishandled the situation. They told the family that Flaherty had not committed any crimes and there was nothing they could do. According to Daniel, Flaherty's daughter had recently left his house after he started brandishing his assault rifle in front of her. He also stated that Flaherty had threatened to murder his wife and daughter, and it was not the first time he had done so. Flaherty's daughter, Emily, had stayed with the Dierico family for two nights after leaving because she was terrified of her father. When asked about Flaherty, Thomas stated that, I can't get into that mind. My honest opinion, he came here looking to take out whoever he could and then get in a firefight with the police, because why else would he be wearing a bulletproof vest? On September 6th, Flaherty was arrested and charged with three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon without intent to kill. I encourage everyone to think about getting a home security system. Even if you never need it, it's better to be safe than sorry. If I were to ask you to think about a dangerous animal, what comes to mind? Bears, snakes, big cats, sharks, things like that? Unless you're from the northern United States or Canada, you probably didn't think of moose first. However, moose can become very dangerous when provoked. They're not typically aggressive, but it's best to keep your distance and not bother them. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game states that moose collisions with vehicles are incredibly dangerous and feeding a moose can also cause them to become aggressive. In the fall, bull moose become especially aggressive because it's breeding season. The video you're about to see was captured on the cell phone of a Colorado resident. The video shows two bull moose fighting each other in the homeowner's driveway. Some people have reposted this video with comedic commentary, which I admit is very funny, but the homeowners are lucky that the fight stayed in the driveway and didn't get any closer to the house. This situation could have gone very differently and could have resulted in serious injury. Speaking of nature becoming dangerous, volcanoes are one of our planet's most fascinating and most dangerous topographical features. They're simultaneously beautiful and treacherous. When dormant, a volcano provides breathtaking views of the surrounding land, but an active volcano can be deadly. At 11.52 a.m. on September 27th of 2014, the Japanese volcano called Mount Ontake erupted. There was no warning about the eruption. It was caused by groundwater rapidly becoming steam, which is known as a hydrothermal eruption. Unfortunately, due to the sudden and unexpected nature of the eruption, there were still a few hundred tourists on the volcano. Some of these people were able to capture the eruption on video. Following the eruption, the authorities began a search effort. Initially, they reported that three people were missing and believed to be buried in ash. Six people were injured. However, these numbers only grew over time. By 7.30 p.m., the estimate rose to six people missing and nine people injured. Later, the number of reported injuries rose to 40 people and the number of missing people was estimated to be 32. 
helicopters scoured the volcano for any sign of the missing tourists. On September 28th, the authorities announced that more than 30 people had been found in cardiac arrest near the summit. The next day, that number had risen to 36. The search effort was suspended due to dangerous conditions which included hydrogen sulfide gas still being released from the volcano. On October 1st, another 11 bodies were discovered by rescue parties. On October 4th, four more corpses were found. The resumed search efforts continued finding bodies until the total reached 57. There were also still six people missing. On January 25th of 2017, the families of five victims filed a lawsuit against Japan and the Nagano Prefecture for damages of 150 million yen. They argued that the government should have issued a warning before the eruption. The Nagano District Court dismissed the lawsuit in July of 2022, but ruled that officials had neglected their duties. Click the join button to become a member today. Channel members receive exclusive content as well as early access to all my content. Elisa Lam was the daughter of immigrants from Hong Kong. She attended the University of British Columbia and administered a blog about fashion and her struggles with mental illness. She had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression, which resulted in her being prescribed several medications. According to her family, she never showed any suicidal tendencies, but she had a habit of not taking her medication, which had caused her to experience hallucinations on several occasions. In January of 2012, Elisa posted about a relapse that had forced her to drop several classes. She became worried that withdrawing from so many courses would result in her getting kicked out of the university. Shortly after this, Elisa announced that she would be abandoning her blog in favor of a different one she had started on Tumblr. This second blog was focused on fashion and quotes that resonated with Elisa. In late January of 2013, Elisa went on a solo trip to California. She traveled alone on Amtrak and public buses, visited the San Diego Zoo, and posted numerous photos on social media. On January 26th, she arrived in Los Angeles, where she eventually checked into the Cecil Hotel. She was initially assigned a shared room on the fifth floor, but her roommates complained about her behavior, which they described as odd. Elisa was moved to a single room. According to the manager of the hotel, Amy Price, Elisa was leaving notes for her roommates with messages such as, go home and go away. She would also lock the door and require them to say a password in order to enter the room. During her stay at the Cecil Hotel, Elisa went to a live taping of Conan in Burbank, where she was escorted off the premises by security for disruptive behavior. On January 31st of 2013, Elisa was scheduled to check out of the Cecil Hotel. Her parents did not hear from her that day, which was very unusual. She had stayed in contact with them every day until then. Elisa's parents contacted the Los Angeles Police Department and took a flight to the City of Angels in order to help with the search effort. Hotel staff reported that Elisa had been alone on the day of her disappearance. A bookstore manager named Katie Orphan, who had seen Elisa, said that she was outgoing, very lively, very friendly. Furthermore, she was talking about what book she was getting and whether or not what she was getting would be too heavy for her to carry around as she traveled. The police searched as much of the hotel as they could and even brought sniffer dogs in. They were unable to pick up Elisa's scent. Following this effort, flyers with Elisa's picture were posted in the neighborhood and on the internet. On February 13th, the police released a video of the last known sighting of Elisa Lam. This video comes from a security camera in one of the hotel's elevators. It shows Elisa behaving very strangely. A few different theories were posited about Elisa's behavior. One suggested that she had been trying to get the elevator to move in order to escape from someone who was chasing her. Other people suggested that she may have been under the influence of ecstasy or another party drug. Yet another theory suggested that she was having a psychotic episode and was possibly hallucinating. Some viewers argued that the footage had been tampered with because almost a minute of the video had been removed. Certain parts were digitally slowed down and the timestamp was obscured.
As the police continued to investigate Elise's disappearance, hotel guests began to complain about low water pressure. Some even reported that the water in their room was black and tasted bad. On February 19th, a maintenance worker discovered Elise's body in one of the hotel's water tanks on the roof. These tanks provided the rooms with running water and Elisa was lying face up in the water. The tank was drained and cut open in order to retrieve Elisa's body. On February 21st, the Los Angeles coroner's office announced that the cause of death had been drowning, with Elisa's mental illness playing a critical role in the accident. There was no evidence of SA or physical trauma to the corpse. The toxicology report showed traces of prescription medicine in Elisa's bloodstream, as well as a sinus relief medicine and an anti-inflammatory. A very small amount of alcohol was found, but no recreational drugs. According to the authorities, the amount of medication in Elisa's system was very small, which made them think that she was under-medicating. The coroner had found cause of death, but it remains unclear how Elisa managed to get into the water tank. Doors and stairwells that led to the roof were all locked and any attempt to force her way in would trigger an alarm. However, the fire escape would have allowed Elisa to climb up to the roof. The tanks themselves would have also been difficult for Elisa to climb into by herself. Maintenance workers required ladders in order to access the tanks. Some people have questioned the coroner's conclusions, suggesting that there was evidence of SA. According to the authorities, this evidence could have also been caused by bloating during decomposition in the water. Finally, Elisa's phone was never found. After her death, her Tumblr blog was updated. It remains unclear how this happened, but it is possible that the updates were made through a queue option that allows posts to be made automatically. Elisa's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the hotel in 2013, claiming that the hotel had failed to properly inspect potential hazards in the building. The hotel argued that the circumstances of Elisa's death could not have been reasonably predicted. The lawsuit was dismissed in 2015. Vopass Flight 2283 was a domestic Brazilian passenger flight from Cascavel to Guarulhos on August 9th of 2024. 35-year-old Captain Danilo Santos Romano was in charge, with 61-year-old co-pilot Humberto de Campos Alansare Silva. There was a total of 62 people aboard the plane, 58 passengers and 4 crew members. The plane was flying at an altitude of 17,000 feet when it stalled and entered a flat spin. The aircraft's descent was captured on video by horrified onlookers. The plane crashed in the front yard of a house in Sao Paulo. Nobody on the ground was killed or injured, but all 62 people aboard the aircraft lost their lives. Amongst the victims were eight doctors, six of whom were traveling to a cancer research conference in Sao Paulo, four professors from Western Parana State University, two staff members of the Federal University of Technology in Parana, and two children. At least 10 people who were supposed to be on the flight had failed to board because they had gone to the wrong gate. Their mistake ended up saving their lives. The others weren't so lucky. The crash of Vopass Flight 2283 was the deadliest plane crash in Brazil since 2007. <laughs> 